Okay, let's get started then. Welcome everyone to our second seminar for the year in our, from our health and physical education team. And today's focus is going to be around a really interesting, very unique, very brave inclusion in terms of curriculum policy reform in these five propositions. So welcome along, we've done, started, started our little activity. Most of you will know that uh, towards the end of 2013, the Australian curriculum was finally endorsed. And then since then, governments, across states and territories have been rolling out their various versions. Now, some might even know the most recent one is PDHPE, and hello to everybody back up in New South Wales, um, in New South Wales. So what that basically tells us is one very simple thing. Curriculum policy reform takes a long time. It can also be wearing on us, so it can also have some things to do with uh, the work that's involved. Policy, we know policy affects teachers in different kinds of ways and we know that policy implementation can sometimes be a big challenge for busy teachers. Taking that in mind, we think that probably some of the things that people will feel about reform are very mixed. They might be fearful, they might be angry, there'll certainly be a lot of uncertainty. And if you don't know exactly what you're doing and how to do it or when you should be doing it, as in the case of New South Wales, um, it can also be quite confusing. So hopefully tonight we will uh, deal with some of those maybe itching, nagging ideas that you might have in your back of your mind about policy reform. Our task, therefore, is to kind of try to allay some of your fears, move you to a state of certainty rather than a state or I think a territory of uncertainty and to help you with some of the confusing aspects. Now I don't think the content is confusing for many of us, bats and balls and health has remained the same. Bodies still operate in particular ways, mostly in ways that we understand, but some of the driving forces behind curriculum reform in this particular case are the new and different things. They're the things that can actually have the potential to bind us. So our session's going to run like this. The little post activity that you've done um, is right here. My name is Karen Lambert and I am four years at, the uni at Monash University in the Health and Physical Education Department down at uh, Peninsula Campus and I'm here with my colleague Justin O'Connor. Oh, hey, Justin. Now I have to apologise for Justin um, because he has a, a bit of a, a frog in his throat. And uh, so um, just take it easy with Justin. There will be no rock star singing, even though he is a very good at Australian rock. <laughs> it's, it's actually true. <laughs> All right. So I think what the, some of the things that we need to be thinking about is that across the country as jurisdictions and states and territories are rolling out curriculum reform, regardless of what they're calling it, the Australian curriculum. Someone asked me today, is this about the Australian curriculum or the Victorian? I went... Well, it's about HPE. So it's about the names not mattering terribly much about who's doing what, but it's about the content being very stable and not so new for some people, but terribly new for others. For example, Northern Territory, Western Australia, some of the concepts, South Australia, Tasmania. So some places are finding it a whole new ball game. Others are just updating their other game. The contexts, I think, are really important because they vary markedly. They go from whatever the southernmost point of Tasmania, and I'm sure someone would be able to tell us that, is through to the top and the breadth and the width of Australia. So our context will vary markedly, as will our, uh, our, our peers, our colleagues that we work with and our students that we work with. So this means that interpretation and enactment will differ across um, jurisdictions and across these various contexts. And our research would suggest that this is a good thing, actually. Multiple interpretations help us to um, make mistakes and develop our skills and our understandings. So we're trying to work things out. We're in a stage of working things out. And that's what curriculum um, basically involves, a process of working out what it means and then putting it into practice in our individual contexts. With that in mind, there's something very interesting which tends to kind of throw that out the window in terms of health and physical education. And that is a rather unique, different, new and innovative idea in the five propositions. 
what these propositions present to us is rather than dis dis dysfunction and fracture amongst contextual variabilities, but, also, but what we have is the opportunity to bind. We have the opportunity to bind across the nation. We have the opportunity to have a commonality, a common language. And I think in terms of jobs for the, any of the people here, especially some of the people here who are training to be teachers, I think this is, this is leverage, this is marketable, and this is something that you could actually take with you. So it's the biggest change. And I give a gonski, so I'm, opt for, I'm up for changes and challenges, and I think it might be an opportunity for us to jump on board to what other people are doing a whole lot of research around and saying, this is the biggest change and this is what we could be doing. I think the stability with regards to this means that regardless of context, you will be able, you will be able to commit to your community, commit to yourself and continue to teach in the ways that you've taught, but up the ante using these practices and these ideas. So our workshop is a focus on the ways in which we can actually support you to do that. Many people think that universities are detached from the, from the realities and the real worlds of, of school classrooms and school communities. Um, and so my colleagues and I uh, did a little research project on ourselves and tried to use these propositions in our own teaching. Our end result was this product that we're going to share with you today. So we produced a resource. Rather than producing a journal article or a, you know, a book or a chapter that we might only use at university, we've produced things for people who work in schools. And so that's what we're sharing today, and the activities are based upon this. So it's pretty exciting for us to share. So if you haven't done so already, introduce yourself, please, to the people at your table. Uh, make sure you know each other's names and uh, we will then go ahead and do the first little activity. So just make sure you know each other's names. Maybe tell them a little bit about what you do, maybe where you work. Okay, so these are going to be the people that you're working with for a little while, and for the first, for the first small activity, this will be your little team. Hello there. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. So for the first small little activity, we're going to do a little bit of uh, technology here. The first activity that you have uh, on your table um, is in the plastic sleeve. So the plastic sleeve will be your first activity. For those folks at home, you get to view a, a table live as they're going through these processes as well as their conversations. So here are outcomes or expected outcomes for this particular session and you'll see that they're quite realistic. It assumes that some of you know what you're talking about and why you're here and you're getting shined up on it and it also assumes that some of you might have no clue and you've just come for some food and a, and a lovely beverage. Um, so whatever, whatever, regardless of why you're here, it's actually all okay. So your t first task is this before you go there. Um, your first task involves taking the green piece of paper out of the sleeve. And let's see if this little wizard comes up, this little thing. Basically, I want you to mix and match first the bright yellow. You have two yellows there, so lay out the five proposition topics. It's a mix and match activity. Take the big yellows with all the words on it and match them to the correct proposition. Justin's just going to show us now on the screen, but not the answers, Justin. So it's a mix and match activity, it shouldn't take you too long. I think these ones are going to be pretty obvious. Yeah, how are we going? <laughs> so it's not too hard. I love that everyone's actually like, reading. This one. Um. So we should have two left. So we have one should be value movement. This is, I, I think this one's about movement. Yeah, I think this one's inquiry. Okay, so the yellow, big, 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 big,
Bingo. 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 That's it. Yeah. We Bingo, think it's wasn't Bingo. 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 Okay, so <laughs> who can tell who, who's got something that you'd like to share about that, their experience? How did it go? Who bingoed? What did you find out? Uh, apart from the purple sheet, essentially maybe having the answers. <laughs> um, we worked out, it, it seemed like in the first couple of sentences you could pretty much put down to mm. what it was. <laughs> yeah. So almost, was almost the first two lines, yeah. Oh, it was easy. Pretty clear. Does everyone feel comfortable with that? All right, so yeah, this is a yeah. safe space for us to actually say that we have read uh, one part, two pages actually of the HPA front end of the HPA curriculum document already, even if you only read one line of the paragraphs associated. So curriculum interpretation starts with reading stuff. There you go, that's, that's an old idea. Don't jump to the answers at the back of the book. <laughs> We're going to get to them later on. <laughs> All right, so that was easy, that part. All right, take the other kind of mm, other yellow, whatever you want to call that, and see now, because there's no thing at the front there, see if you can mix and match them. Okay? Also notice the size of them, the information, how it's changed or varied. Justin's now doing it randomly. I'm sorry, what should we do with this one? Same type same, of same, thing, yeah? Same type of thing. We've it's just got the end of it instead of... Oh, this would be space-based. Mm -hmm. Health literacy. Health literacy. I think it is, this talks about particular yeah, strengths and resources. <coughs> so I'm guessing it's there. This one's about analysing and evaluating. Oh, I just heard Critical, yeah. maybe? Yeah. Yeah. But isn't it great to have some mates that you can talk to? <coughs> this one says... Prioritizes. Oh, this is health and movement behaviours too. Mm -hmm. okay. This one is this one is movement. Movement, yeah. There we go. So Progression and development work. alongside meaning making and application in contemporary health and movement context. Meaning. So, so what have we got? We've got meaning making and applications. Change. Right. The um, meaning making leads me yeah. to believe. I think so. Yeah. It's purposeful. Movement challenges. Building non so learning in schools, assess health information. Health, 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 literacy, health literacy in building the knowledge, skills, research, good. Valuing movement. Yep. Yep. Strengths based. The firms that all students in the community have particular strengths and resources. Well done. Mm. Give us a yell, it doesn't matter if you get this kind of part. A little bit confused, yeah. we'd love you to get it right at the end. Okay, we've got a bingo down the back and we've got a bingo. All right, so rather than, of course, because this was more an interpretive task based upon communication, this would be something that I would highly recommend you go back to your school departments and actually do. Because if people don't know what you're talking about, they can't plan things. So they can't program and plan things if they're uncertain about what things actually mean. Um, who's got a learning from that activity? How did it go compared to the other one? Easier, harder, harder, why? Yeah, the answers weren't there. <laughs> yeah. You had to read the whole lot of the other one to work out what the little one said because the little ones didn't really very closely, yeah, and that's a good trick, right? Okay, is this what we want our students to do? Form links between connections and, and learning and have conversations with people. Justin's going to pop up the, the pink sheet there and it, you can show them the pink sheet there and he can tell you which ones are right and wrong if he wanted to. It's nice and easy. Just go and check. I've got it just in handwriting on the side so you should be able to see that. Um, I think the key to the term f um, focus on educative purposes is around this idea of progression and developmentality, though we have some different takes on this, which is really interesting. In our emerging takes that we looked at two years ago are quite different to what they are actually now, what we're thinking about these things, and that's part of that interpretation process. Strength-based approach, um, students and their communities have particular assets and resources. 
health literacy, knowledge, understanding, skills. And what you probably got a little confused around is some of the valuing movement where we threw in the idea that movement is also about health and well-being, not just about bats and balls and, and, uh, and running around and legs. So congratulations. We now have an interpretive task. We've started to interpret a curriculum and we've started to do quite nuanced interpretations of it. And this is the sort of stuff that people, um, very smart people, write journals, articles about. But the best part is these are practical, usable things for us. Okay. Yep. Okay. So moving on now, what we're going to do in your groups is we're actually going to give you the gift, the thing that you've all come for, and that is the cards, a deck of cards. So each one of you will get a deck of cards, and, and I encourage you to have a quick flick through. We'll give you 30, 40, 60 seconds or so to do that, and then we're going to give you an activity to do that's going to increase the interpretation and our knowledge based upon these. And then later in the session, we're going to look at them in action. So we're thinking interpretation first half and enactment in the second part. Okay, so Dexter, there you go. So here they come. We might get a little helper over here. I'll pick up the spares. I'll pick up the spares. There you go. All right. So they're lovely and shiny and colourful, and you can obviously tell why we didn't put them on the desk uh, or give them to you in the, um, in the food room, because you all would have looked at the shiny things and wanted to play with them. So take a quick play with them. May I? Thank you. Now, I didn't... Yeah, so the, yeah, the, people at, the people at home, actually, you've got a PDF of these um, and you can use that PDF. It has the same information on it, so they haven't got the hard copies sent to them. And we give some details at the end of the workshop where these can actually be purchased if you want to get staff sets of them in uh, New South Wales and Victoria and actually nationally. So um, in your group there, I want you just to decide, every, I, want, I want you just to decide on one each that you want to take a quick look at. So someone's already in this group dibs critical inquiry, but you've got a group, just make sure all of them get covered. There can be a double up. All right? So just choose colour if you want. If you don't have any idea about anything or you want to know more about it. Oh, you can't all be blue. You can't all pick blue, so you choose a different colour. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Got one each. First dibs. Yep. 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 First dibs, mate. <laughs> that seems so to me, that one. one. And we've Good got a piece of value. So I was going to say this. They're pretty interchangeable. Very much of our time as teachers, especially in planning, is spent alone. We sit down individually to make sense of things and then we share it with our colleagues and our peers. So this is the activity that we're going to do. I'm going to give you around 67 seconds to just read over that card. Now, the benefit of this is you've actually got some other terms and some definitions on your desk that you can draw on. So you can have a quick read of them as well. You are trying to get some individual knowledge now on one. Okay, so you've got 60 seconds and take a bit of a look at that. You can use, James, this is where that purple sheet comes in handy because it's just another set of information that actually comes from New South Wales. Our cut up bits there are from uh, Victoria and from our cards and the purple sheet that's also included is from New South Wales. So you're just, just having a quick read, getting your head around it, getting the feel of it. For those folks at home, you might be doing the same thing, maybe flick over them all or choose to focus on just one. Once you think you've got your head around it a little bit, you've got a few ideas, we'll then move to the next little activity. Okay. So hands up if you are on orange, if you've chosen an orange one. And what is the orange one? Health literacy. Health literacy. Okay, so we should have a few health literacy people. Hands up if you have chosen valuing movement. Hands up if you've got focus on educated purposes. Hands up critical inquiry. And what's the last one that I missed out? Nice job already, you've learned something. Yeah, fantastic. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to form expert groups now. What this is going to involve is getting up. 
and we're going to put the domains not far. So we've got a couple of stations set up around the, around the room. All right. This station here will be a valuing movement station because it's being recorded. So whoever's got that can stay there. Um, let's go with, if you're an orange, go over there. Is that best to fill those ones? Yes, yeah, so it doesn't matter. If you're a pink here, yeah, purple here, we'll go there. The green's there and the blue's there. So just leave those ones for now. Okay, so let's go. You don't need to take your gear because you'll actually be coming back to your table or maybe to another table that we could set up. Okay, orange. Valuing movement over here. You shouldn't be. Where's the health literacy folks? Yeah, can you, yeah, can you join them on Dean? Can you join the health literacy, if that's okay? Just want to get the numbers. Who's got purples? How do we end up with so many focus on educative purposes? Some people didn't read the instructions, did you? Yeah. Right, kids. Yeah. All right, so this one I might have, have to ask. To have. Nona, can I, can I ask one of you to go for the purples <laughs> over here? There's only one person there. Actually, take Probably two of you, take two. Ten two, yeah, so she's got someone to talk to. Right. Just, you can go in and say. Yeah. One of you go. What do you think? What and is maybe one movement? from this group, maybe can if you can go and join the purple too. You'll be fine, you'll pick it up, just no troubles at all. So we've got about four in each group. Three or four in each group. I'd like to look at movement as a, a tool mm -hmm. instead of as a So most of you should be familiar with this pedagogy. Um, it's forming movement. expert I'll, I'll groups. Like where your focus is on now no, having a conversation in your group about that one sort of proposition I think and becoming an expert like in this. The obvious next step is you go back to your group else. and you fill in your group about what you found. Uh, according so, to me, here's your task. Thinking of a decision. Have a chat. And, uh, have a conversation about what you see. Work out uh, what you think it is. So Even more, drill down and find some key words that maybe make it a bit different to what's already been handed out to you on these sheets. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's go for that. That's your next activity. About? Oh, Have a conversation about that. them. I think, um, what are they? This is a meaning and interpretation process, so you're having a chat about them. Feel free to write on the tables. Yes. Valuable assessment. Yep. Because I think it's hard to, if you're trying to get students to value, you know, how their bodies feel in space or doing an activity or whatever. It's hard to engage that, so it's yep. just finding assessment ways to probably not like just, oh, you ran five metres, yeah, you're good on you. Like. Yeah. Okay, so we can talk, we can talk loud, you don't have to whisper. Okay. The, other thing, <laughs> the other thing I think, I, I, I don't know why this just is doing a student and we've had to study it, but as soon as I hear movement, I think him through and about. Yep. Arnold, that's the, yeah. Yeah, that's the... I always just go, okay, movement, and then I've got this movement, this movement, this movement. Right. And that's mm -hmm. the. So you notice in through and about is somewhere here. I saw that at the bottom left. Um, which one? Yeah, so it's the bottom left yeah. um, on the card. It's got um, how you're using teaching activities and assessment as a means to learn in through and about. So what do you think? What do you think moving or learning in movement is? What do you think that would be? So it's related to intention teaching or? So if we wanted to do some, um, if we wanted to make sure that we were teaching not just a, about movement or, or through movement you're going to become a better human being or you're going to be a better person or you know you're going to have um, better health scores. Um, in movement kind of talks about the idea that it's, it's actually learning whilst doing you know, mm -hmm. the experience itself mm -hmm. and even reflection on experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we learn when we move. Mm -hmm. It's an implicit as part, part of learning, uh, part of moving. Mm -hmm. So that might be um, putting value on that because often we value the kind of technical assessment. So we might, and that's about movement. So we, we do a biomechanical analysis of movement mm -hmm. or we measure it in terms of fitness tests. But what really this is talking about is saying, Maybe we should value movement for movement's sake, and how do we value that? Well, we need to assess how it affects people internally, you know, and, and try and unpack the meanings that movement creates. So why do we all participate in movement? It's not because 
we had, we strive for the biomechanically correct technique, mm -hmm. it's because it, good. it makes us feel good. And, mm -hmm. and what are those feelings and how can we um, explore those and how can we assess student um, language and understandings of their ability to capture that and what it means. So, so yeah, I think that's an important element and, and therefore what kinds of movement are going to be important. So it's not just about rolling out the ball and playing sport. If we're going to value movement, um, it needs to be valuable mm -hmm. and what movement is considered valuable by the young people we work with. Mm -hmm. And so what is important to them? Does that depend on context? It, it does, it? yeah. Mm -hmm. So it may be that, um, you know, movement attached to future work is something that's considered mm. important, you know. I want to be a fireman or a, an ambo mm. or I want to mm. be a, a nurse. So what kind of movements am I going to need to be able to help me fulfil those roles? Mm. Or it might be that um, I love the aesthetics of movement or I love the surge or the feelings I get from surfing. So those kinds of movements are just as important as maybe the more technical, tactical invasion games or sports that we often see. Um, and, and so what can we... What can we get out of that experience and how can we look at that as part of what we do and make it more explicit and bring it to the fore? And I think, I think the kind of key challenge here is it's, it's about variety and, and not just variety for variety's sake to keep everybody busy, but it's about opening up pathways and, and ideas of what is lifelong participation in physical activity and what will that mean. Is that sort of touching on sort of building that foundation of, of movement almost? Yeah, I mean, diverse experiences give us diverse reasons to want to continue to move. So, um, you know, at a young age, the more we have opportunities to play and fall and, you know, um, experience and get that joy and that rush and, and have that sort of sensation of mastery, you know, mastering your own body. Um, that sets you up for further exploring those experiences and, and we look for new ways we can challenge ourselves and learn through movement. So, yeah, I think, I think it does mean good foundations have diverse experiences and exposures to a range of different movement contexts. Um, being in water, you know, is a really powerful place to be in movement and, and to really value what that feels like, that sensation. Yeah, maybe just pick one of the questions and have a read and see if you can kind of unpack it. Pick one you're not really convinced about. What are you looking at, James? I'm interested in the top right one. So yep. what opportunities can you create for students to choose how under what circumstances and for what purpose they need. Yeah. Um, That's a good one. So what would that involve, do you think? I think that would be shifting. To me, that sounds like shifting the shifting the, the power almost to the students and say, what, are, what do they think about movement? Um, what's important in movement to them? Um, how do they enjoy moving? Yeah, so it, it, you go on. Yeah, right? it's like just like a lot of student choice and context in, yeah. in your class. Of what your students yeah. So in theory, you could yeah. scaffold, we could set up a framework that had all students doing the same kind of thing, heading in the same direction, but doing different kinds of movements. So if you think of a, um, a movement to rhythm or body, a, a beats, you know, moving to a beat, mm -hmm. one group of kids might find that it's really cool to do with basketballs and get basketballs moving to a beat and a rhythm. Another group might think it's really neat to do it with um, frisbees or something else, and another group might do hip-hop moves, but effectively they're all still moving to a beat. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're allowing students to have some ownership about how, how they want to extend what they value as important movements, and you might find... You know, the, there's a group of um, learners who really love dance and there's a group of learners who love to express themselves in a slightly different movement form and another group in a different movement form. So how could we in this one sort of structured unit allow for individual choice without letting it get out of, out of control? And it's not just a free-for-all, it has to be scaffolded and supported, but um, it might be you can do that sort of thing. So creative games making... You know, a way I can create my own game that I value, but also share that with others and then have others enjoy that as well, you know. So it gives you that ownership and that choice. So I think that's an, it's a way to think about innovating movement spaces. Um, uh, you might choose 
workplace movements, but what you think of as a workplace movement might be radically different to what I think of. And so you might share with me something completely that I hadn't thought of and vice versa. Okay. What were you looking at, Maddie? Um, your, your group might like to also think about where your starting points about what valuing movement is... Is not. Is not. Yeah. Or it's not only these particular mm. kinds of things. Yeah, we've kind of touched on that, I think. Um, we're starting to get the idea that it's not just about sport or doing more sport, you know, and sport's the only thing we do. Because if we look at the data, we know that by the time kids are 14, they're already pulling out of organised, structured sports and they're looking for other ways to engage themselves. And it's usually social, right. it's informal. So let's just take another yeah. maybe 60 seconds or so to get, to get your head around enough words that when you go back to talk to your colleagues or your peers, you will be able to have a story around this. And you'll have a definitional, interpretive, and maybe for some of you, some examples. Because I've heard some people talking about examples of work. Maddie, which one was yours? Um, mine was how can you facilitate discovery, curiosity, and critically um, about different ways of knowing and doing movement. Yeah, so the second bottom one on the right. Yes. How can you facilitate discovery, curiosity, and criticality about different ways of knowing and doing movement? Mm -hmm. So what do you think that might involve? For me, um, just recently, I did a dance unit, yep. and I think that, <laughs> I don't know, that kind of just struck me because um, I had to, you know, pursue movement in a different form that I hadn't been previously sort yep. of exposed to. Um, and yeah, it challenged me to think outside the box and yeah. do things differently. And what did you learn about yourself through doing that? Um, I. I just really liked the way I felt in doing yeah. dance movements and stuff, which I hadn't previously. And dance is one of those kind of, it's kind of performative, but when you're in there, it's very embodied. It's very in yeah. the moment. You don't think about what other people are thinking so much. It's no. about how am I, what is my body doing yeah. right here and, and right as, now? As soon as, you set, as soon as you set aside that supportive space, mm. then it, it, it didn't matter, yeah. matter what you were doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Once, once you had, well, I don't know, with the similar unit, once once I knew that everyone else was doing the same thing and we're all doing it differently, that yeah. it didn't yeah. matter what I did. Yeah, and so when you, and that's a great example, I think dance is a great example of being in movement, like you are in the moment, you're hearing the music, you're thinking about what your body's doing, your body's responding to the environment, mm -hmm. it's, it's being dragged and pulled in, <coughs> in different ways and you just kind of go along, with, you know, you, you're not in a... You're not in an analytical frame, you're in a, an, a doing frame. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a, and so how do we unpack that? How do you drag that out of your students? So I imagine mm -hmm. you would have done some reflection, you would yeah. have done maybe some um, sort of thinking about what, what that felt like, so some feeling expression words. Yeah, so yeah. We did, yeah a lot of, um, we did a weekly team reflection and stuff on how we actually felt in the movement, um, what we learnt in movement and then we brought in um, dance tools and um, So there was terms, a technical a element? Technical yeah. element. Um, we videoed um, our performances and then yeah. the analysis and breakdown of that. So um, there was an, so you had an analytical frame, you had a, a, a knowledge base, like a, a set of knowledge skills you were learning and you had an embodied in movement kind of reflection activity yeah. and that all formed part of that assessment. Mm -hmm. And I imagine you weren't scored on okay, your, folks, your performance. You were scored on your performance. I think the, the Don't performance your original was a tiny, tiny, tiny yeah. Yeah. Make sure you have your ideas ready to be sharing with mm. the people about your table. table. Yeah, self-reflection using the Don Hallison model. And yep. Cool. Like that. yeah. that's, so. that's it. You got it. Okay. So, don't forget your card. Right, you've got to go back to your ideas. Go back to your group. Head back to your group and explain it all to you. Your job now is to go back and explain that. <laughs> <laughs> remember where you It's so nice to have a big, huge space where you can do multiple things in multiple ways. Word? All right, yeah. so the next part of this here? task is back the same oh, essentially you went away for about 10 minutes to become an expert around this one. Do we? It's me and Costa. Now you're going to each take. I'm offended she said that. Now you take maybe about 60 seconds. 
because you have to be able to do this in an elevator, remember? You have to be able to answer a call from a parent, remember? In a very short period of time so you can get off. Right, so you have to be clear and succinct about what you're talking about. If you have an example, you might be able to share that. But let's just whip around. Everybody should have at least one person at their group who can share in from each of them. So if you've got double ups, this would be where you just add. Let someone speak and then just go, oh yeah, I agree with her. Or I'd like to add. Go for it. Go for it. The biggest thing I took away from our discussion was that valuing movement wasn't just about the movement itself. It was about sort of everything to do with movement from um, the sort of internal feelings you get from movement to using movement as a tool for learning um, and also that exterior as, as more like techniques, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, it was, it was a lot more than just the physical notion of movement. Yeah. That, was a, that was a big thing I got from valuing movement. Yeah. Is there any examples you could share? Some of the um, things you talked about that, that kind of expressed some of that? So we discussed, um, yeah, we discussed, we do a unit on um, dance, which a lot of people um, might not be super familiar with, but it was through that experience we learnt like the feelings of doing the dance itself. Um, we learnt the, um, the, the context in that everyone can do something different and it doesn't matter if I do something different to you, it's mm. that reflection upon how it felt for you as a person and yeah, yeah that's all mm. I remember mm. for that one. I like it. Well, I, I had critical inquiry uh, and so we talked about the deeper understanding that comes from physical activity and, and, and health. Uh, so looking at issues that affect your society, your community, um, uh, and, and looking at creative solutions that can be used to, you know, be an active member of your community. So, um, so we looked at that. We looked at, um, we, we thought that it was about um, having some sort of uh, personal growth in, in, your, in yourself. So, for example, looking at what things might be meaningful to you and how you can... Uh, you can grow through that process and you can learn through that process so you know one of the examples that we talked about is like well my community doesn't have for example um, a park that has uh, fitness equipment around it okay so what what are some of the options that we have in our community uh, to be able to be active in that in that environment in that society so so we looked at uh, some of those sorts of things so yeah um, I guess yeah, so I think it condensed to being inquiring about what goes on in your local environment and, and applying meaning to that for yourself, personal meaning for yourself. So, yeah, so that's what we sort of established. Cool. So there's a couple of, couple of dimensions there, and I also noticed in your definition or your example in particular, it crosses over into a couple of the other cards, which we'll get to. Um, and that's fine because that's what this stuff does. It all blends in with each other and that they can have dual meanings yeah. and you'll find that oh that's very similar to critical inquiry and this is the same so that's mm. that's absolutely okay because we see the same things um and and i guess there's a couple of ways you could frame it there's there's the inquiry part where you send students off to find out mm. the assumption there is that they are capable of doing good quality research when they when often that isn't the case so you need to scaffold and skill them up on that because often we send them off to go and look up something or find out something and they just don't have the tools of critical inquiry they're unable to be critical mm. about the kind of information they're engaging with so we have to be clever and careful about how we support that but it may be to investigate their local community or look at options for different types of um, activity or different people um, and to ask the question, if you want to take this to a socially critical inquiry, they ask the question of who's included and who's excluded mm. and on what grounds and who controls the power. Because 
that brings the socio-critical element into it, which is more than just inquiry. It's about asking questions of ourselves and others and society and saying, are we happy with this? Yeah. If this thing only caters for this particular group of people, are we going to accept that or are we going to challenge that? And mm. I think that's where we would see this pushing into is that notion of being socially critical, aware of who is included, who is excluded, where is the power? And yeah. if you can ask those kind of interrogating questions, things like gender and um, ableism and um, healthism and all those other problems we see can start to be addressed. So it really does fit across that health PE kind of continuum. One of the, one of the group members, before I pass on, but one of the group members asked a really important question, which was, how can the students take action from what they have learned? Yeah. And we're like, yeah, actually, that's what we really want them to yeah. do, don't we? We want them yeah. to take action in some and, way. And sometimes the learning is that they learn how helpless they are, you know? Mm. And because sometimes the problem doesn't sit at an individual level. In fact, often the problem doesn't sit at an individual level. It sits at a, a political level. Mm. But it's about activism, not mm. necessarily being able to make the change yourself but understanding how that occurs and what's the situation I'm in and then becoming an activist, yes. which may mean you're powerless and that's okay to learn that. Mm. You know, I think that's important to learn that. Mm. Um, and then there are other times you are, are going to be able to make wholesale change mm. and to learn what those, how to negotiate that is absolutely crucial yeah, and yeah. that kind of underpins that approach. Mm. So yeah, well picked up. It's yeah. a really good summary. Mm. All right, next. Well, I, th I think I was links in a little bit to what David was saying with health literacy into that critical inquiry because we looked at words like um, growth mindset, future planning, strengths-based, so, you know, yeah. about strengths-based approach to health literacy as well, um, how pedagogy comes into it and it's really important to determine how you teach about yeah. health literacy, um, making sure that there's a variety of resources that are drawn upon, that it's not just... Mm the main things that you see in media or, um, you know, the latest fad that yeah. people are doing for their diets or that's the yeah. ex examples that we thought about. Um, having a positive approach, there's, there's areas in the card itself that talks about, you know, not leading from a deficit model. Um, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, what it wasn't, and we've just kind of added to this page, it's, it wasn't, health literacy is not about <coughs> what not to do. So not always saying, don't eat this, don't eat that. Mm. Or don't not exercise this way or whatever mm. it might be. Um, not negativity based. And we really focused in on the future planning side of it. So thinking about what could potentially be the next Hmm. big thing in, in health and fitness and hmm. yeah. um, looking forward planning yeah you know and yeah that's, that's really good a lot good. of people think that one is about reading labels and just you know yeah. deciphering la food labels and understanding that which it, it can be I mean a part of health being health literate is to decipher and interpret information and make sense of it. Mm. Um, but it can be a bit more than that. And you'll notice the crossover within critical inquiry and strengths-based. Mm. Kind of put those three two together. Yeah, and, that and seem, seems like to me that these two are yeah. on, on surface. Yeah, it's these pretty hard to do it. Pretty, yeah. pretty linked. Yeah, it's hard to do a health literacy without using a critical yeah. inquiry yeah. It's exploratory mindset. in a way yeah. as well, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 And there might be no one right answer. Oh, mm. no. There might be many ways to unpack and understand this. Um, mm. you, know, you could you could say um, Australia has an obesity crisis, explain, and you'll get several different mm. ways to unpack and understand that and, and interpret that. And, and I think that's okay too. All right, good. So far, so good. How are we going? What do you um, got? Yes, uh, it was a uh, take strength-based uh, approach. Actually, now it seems like to me at least, that it's like a part of developing health literacy. Mm -hmm. So, If anything, developing a health literacy means also taking a strengths-based approach. Yes. Yeah. Does that yes. make sense? So yes. if you're going to do yes. this, it's not just what's bad, what what shouldn't we do, don't eat this, don't do that. Yeah, only positive stuff. Um, and yeah. Yes, and it's like, for example, we were discussing an example of like stress, for example, how are you going to explain to your students how to cope with the stress? Uh, we also need to concentrate on positive things, like, mm. for example, you need to do yoga classes or you need to do this or that. We shouldn't talk about negative, what can like actually stress cause, yes. right? So yeah. we're just concentrating on positive things. But also positive 
stress because there's stress can be That's right. positive. Sometimes it stress depends is how good. you yeah, see. Yeah, motivates you. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah. yeah. get the assignment mm. done. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, pretty much that's it. So that, that I think is right. With, when you're talking about a continuum of health, so we're not thinking that you're healthy or unhealthy. We're thinking we're all, we're all on a continuum. Mm. In fact, in the, the theory that this comes from, we're all in the river of life and we're all floating down that river. And what a strengths-based approach is understanding the resources and the assets you have available to you to make that trip down the river as enjoyable and as fruitful and as helpful and wonderful mm. as it possibly can be. So what... What are the key resources, assets, strengths I have personally, but also exist around me socially and in the environment to support me on my journey through life, knowing that I am at some point going to be diseased and ill because um, we're all going to die and that disease and illness is part of that process. So it's not just ignoring the negative, but it's going, okay, you know, we acknowledge that happens, but how can I utilise my strengths and resources to make this um, as enjoyable as possible? Yeah, noting that I could be anywhere on the continuum on any given day, mm. and that I'm never, you know, I may be um, in a state of stress and anxiety. But what have I got? What tools can I draw upon to help me cope with that and pull me more towards being less stressed? Not mm. saying I'm going to be perfect, but help me along that continuum. So I think, I think that's a. Um, if you want to do any more reading on strengths-based approach, salutogenesis is a really mm -hmm. complicated term, but a really yeah. nice theory which complements pathogenesis, which is the theory of disease, disease. Oh. Salutogenesis is the, is the theory that looks at the other side of that coin, which is heading towards healthfulness. Yeah. And it's what does on that this one. Yeah, the word. On, yeah. <laughs> the word is on salutogenic and she... Thank yeah. you. She, <laughs> she caught me off guard and was like, you're in Yeah, I know. I'm like, Costa, come on. <laughs> you're in second year, mate. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm like, uh, just, it's, it's, it's a nice complementary. It's not saying get rid of the pathogenic stuff, but the pathogenic stuff um, where we always treat illness mm. is not really looking at the way we could avoid it or, mm. or push out of it ourselves and, and move forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right, who's next? Blue card. Costa was with me. Um, it's here. We discussed with uh, my group that um, <clears throat> giving, for example, students, as a teachers, giving uh, students uh, opportunity to have uh, physical activities is, uh, is not only for do it, and they have to know why they yeah. are doing that, to yeah. keep doing this until the rest of their lives. So they might have to start to... Okay. The purpose behind yeah. movement. The purpose behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, I, I mean, I think of this one, it's pretty obvious, you know, we're in a school, <laughs> we're yeah. teachers, it's everything, just the scaffolding, everything should have an educative purpose, yeah. but the reality is it doesn't always, mm. and so often we will roll out the ball and do busy, happy, good, and everyone will be entertained for an hour, and at the end of that hour, we won't have a clue what happened and who learnt what and how yeah. much they learnt, and if we don't take account of that, then that can be outsourced relatively quickly mm. and relatively cheaply. Um, mm. if, if all we do is entertain and keep kids busy, then we are, I would argue, are not doing the job of a teacher and we shouldn't belong in a school. So, I don't much learn um, lunchtime. Yep, and, mm. and um, if phys ed is just glorified activity space, organised activity space, then I think we do ourselves a disservice and we undermine what, what and who we stand for. So this is about putting a stamp on, well, what is it I stand for? What is it I'm hoping this lesson stands for? What is it students are going to learn through participating in this hour and a half or hour class? And what are the outcomes going to be? And what am I expecting that to look like? And let's make that explicit and transparent and clear and allow people to understand that's the kind of terms of engagement. And um, yeah, it's, it sounds almost silly, but I think it's probably the most important card and the one that we don't do very well at all. Um, in health and phys ed. I think we kind of <coughs> underestimate our potential in this space and could do a heck of a lot more to develop that. So I, I would probably pull that one out first if I was in charge yeah, of a, yeah. and go, what is the educative purpose of this lesson? Yeah. You know? yeah. What was the intent? What were they, and how can you know? How can you show me they learnt something? What is it they learnt? And if that, you can't have that conversation, it's not clear, then you would argue, well, why is it here? What are we doing? Mm. Um, yeah. And this card, I guess you could, used to plan with with many subjects absolutely you know, this, i mean i mean yeah. all the cards yeah, exactly. in a way yeah. you could if you're going to integrate yep your subjects yep you could use across the board 
you could value movement in the decimal yeah. place yeah. in mathematics. Also, <laughs> but, it, but also that learning styles that they yeah. 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 learn yeah. yeah. differently. Yeah. 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 Is also a um, interpretive task. That's great. You've interpreted yourselves. You share with each other. Every time something is changing, someone says to me, "Oh yeah, I think that. Oh yeah, I might think that too now." So we're building upon our collective knowledge, and I can't harp on this enough. Going back to schools and having these conversations, it's a fifteen-minute conversation that starts with interpretation and then moves to action. Does anyone know what I mean? There it is. My clicker. It loves wandering around the room. And who wouldn't have such a lovely room? Alright, let's write a headline. Great nice. piece of uh, sticky paper now, and uh, it would be remiss of us to not use the next best things in education in Victoria and talk about visible learning teaching. Um, and uh, I want you to write yourself a headline for, uh, for this topic in your topic knowledge right now. You can stay, you can return. So if you were to write a headline right now that captured the most important aspects of what you just experienced in this group activity, what would that headline be? Holy cow! Batman! That's not a headline. <laughs> Holy cow. Batman wins again. Okay, what's your headline? A routine for capturing the essence of the experience. It's not easy, yeah, I know, right? This is a hard class. Yeah. Well, that's what uni's about, right? Yep, your take home. It can be just a one liner. Um, I had a great take home from a lady over here, and that was these propositions are interrelated, Karen. And I went, that's a great headline. So it might have been an aha moment, it might have been you putting things together, it might have been a moment of, oh no, I've got more to do. That's okay, it's your headline. All right, let's move on, we've got our headlines. We're gonna move on now to an enacting. All that front session stuff was all about what in curriculum terms, people in policy terms called interpretation. So the enactment part is the stuff that's to do with the doing. So what we're going to do um, in this section is we're going to talk about, oh, by the way, too, a big thing that, that, that I forgot to tell you about is probably that some of you notice that sometimes these cards appear like they might be definitional. Sometimes they appear like they might almost be a set of glasses you put on, like a, taking a critical inquiry approach. Sometimes they might appear like they advise you or inform your pedagogy. Well, Justin and I and my colleagues very strongly believe that they can be all of those things, that we feel that they are all each a lens, so a way to look at content, a way to look at assessment, a way to think of planning, as well as a pedagogy, a way to begin to plan our everyday teaching and learning strategies in classrooms and our assessment tasks. So, dual lens. We're now going to have a quick look at assessment. We're talking about achievement standards, stage statements in New South Wales, levels, who knows what everyone's calling them, but, but they're basically the things that everyone says at the end of X, usually a two-year band or a, across a two-year stage, this will happen. And this is what these things are for. It's about the skills of what they can and what they cannot do. Here's now what I'd like you to do. Use your proposition lens and have a, con have a read of what you see up there on the screen. And what I'd like you to identify is where you see the five propositions jumping out at you. So this is from the Victorian Health and Physical Education Curriculum. So just on screen, where do you see the propositions jumping out? What words indicate that they're there? Health literacy, focus on educ purposes, strength base. Have a chat with your group, go for it.
Yeah. Is that all right? How about this? This is the second paragraph that goes with the... the I know, it's quick. The, the point is, they're all there. The answer is, isn't it? Yeah. We're using the lens. It's two paragraphs. And congratulations, you've just read one more page of the Victorian Curriculum of Health and Physical Education. So when we use this as a lens, we can actually be looking for aspects. So language can actually help us to find these propositions inside particular things. And in this case, it's inside the assessment, um, the assessment, the achievement standards. So have a quick chat at your group now. How might you bring, because we're now shifting a little bit to pedagogy, how might you now bring some ideas around these propositions to some assessment tasks that you maybe have in your schools already? Could you bring right now, and if someone has one that they'd like to share, or an assignment they've done maybe? Um, but have a conversation about what impact the cards might have on how you think about assessment at your school. Do you have an assessment task in mind and what could you give it a makeover? Real quick, we're going to do that for about five minutes. The learning leader of health and physical mm -hmm. education. Um, so, yeah, so my area incorporates, um, so integrated health and physical education, um, f um, food and food studies. Um, and we have a life skills component to that as well. Yep. So, um, yeah, in terms of whether we have an assessment that sort of approaches the five propositions in, in one, I would, I would say we don't. I've never. I've got to be honest and say we don't. Yeah. I've never really thought of these in terms of assessment. I was, as soon as I saw these, I thought, okay, this will influence my planning, yeah. but not assessment. Mm. I, I just think that I'd almost plan a, a unit or an activity and then I'd tick these off and go, okay, does it do this? Does it do this? Yeah. Does it do this? But I've never thought about it. You see, so. I, I, think, I, think, I think we've got to go back from, from where, you know, historically health and physical education has been, certainly in my school, mm. in my, and, and things haven't changed. For, for, for some time, yeah. I haven't been there for that long, but I would say that the, the attitude is very—it's a very conservative approach. Things don't change very quickly at all. Um, so we haven't started with the propositions. We haven't started with mm. the 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 you know Victorian curriculum statements and so on. Yeah. It, it, it's just we almost need to start again. You know, we need to just start again. To free ride it, Cause, Yeah, because from there, then you're going, then you're working backwards. You're going, okay, well, we know where they need to go. Yeah. So therefore, what assessments do we need to do to get them to there? Yeah. And then you look at them with the lens of that. Correct. And that's, that's what I was thinking too, with sort of coming from like a placement position. So we send students out in cohorts for, yeah. for HPE. And what we need is for schools to know what they're going to teach before our students come out mm -hmm. so that they can actually apply this lens and do some really innovative planning yep. so that when they get out on well, placement, thing, well, they instead can... Of, you know, instead of getting to placement and then going, oh, exactly. I've got to teach That's right. how to watch for tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so with, with given, giving that, given that outline of the Victorian curriculum from Year 10, I would suggest that they need to kind of highlight a section and say, okay, that's the bit that we want you to look Can at you through this lens. Yeah. And then we develop, develop that unit at uni and then they go and enact the unit mm -hmm. when they head out mm -hmm. to placement. And that would be an ideal scenario. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and that, that's what we're trying to do. Get towards. Um, but the, the, I think kind of alludes to what you were saying, yeah. that, that pre-understanding of what you're going to do in that lens, it's slow moving, like you, you can't always get out of what you've done before. Yeah. Um, so it would be very hard to go from that traditional aspect yep. and shifting it slowly and oh, it's yeah. almost like you would have to throw a bomb on it and like you said, start from scratch. And you yep. need everyone yep. on board. So if David goes back and he's 
keen to do it, he has to get the buy-in from everyone right, else. Everyone. Yes. Um, and then the next step you. comes. I have, I have <laughs> no idea. Um, so your next task is actually this. On your tables, you have a thing that you can put in the bag. So you can put it in your bag. 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 You can put it in the focus areas, and all these focus areas still exist in all the curriculums across Australia. These are the focus. Oh, I took these, yeah. these copies, this information from the Australian curriculum because I'm a little bit of a, I'm a little bit of an information hog. So I want to know what everybody said about the same things, because there's one good way to learn, and that is to repeat, the, repeat the same thing over and over, but in a different way. So remember to repeat, repeat to remember, but also learn the same thing, but in a different way. So let's take a look at this piece of content you have. This is a focus area. You might have, I've got here lifelong physical activities. Bring your lenses, bring your uh, focus on educative purposes, bring your strength base, have a conversation about how you might bring the propositions to this content. So just for the folks at home, we've got safety and it's about addressing safety issues that students may encounter in their daily lives. The content supports students to develop knowledge, understanding and skills to oh, make safe decisions um, in ways that protect their own safety and the safety of others. It is expected that students at appropriate intervals across the continuum of learning from foundation to 10 will learn about safety at school, safe practices at home, safe and unsafe situations, strategies for dealing with unsafe or uncomfortable situations, safe practices, managing personal safety, first aid, emergency care, safety when participating in physical activity and relationships and dating safety. So let's, let's pass the card over, maybe just pick one. Um, Critical inquiry. Mm, I was just thinking about that one. Because mm -hmm. safety could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Yeah. We, when I was a kid, I used to catch a tram home with my brother when I was five. Yeah. And my parents considered that safe. Yeah. Um, nowadays, maybe not. Mm. I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, yeah, so it just I, made me think of that. Yeah, first. if you're being critical, you wouldn't just go, things are safe and things are unsafe. Mm. You would have a... a it's a spectrum of uh, yeah, safety. Yeah, yeah. And, and you would have different interpretations for different people at different contexts. Mm. So you would, you would probably spend time unpacking what, does it, what is this word safe or yeah. safety if you're taking a critical inquiry and approach. And I'm just thinking globally. Mm. I mean, we think, see things that are happening. I've kind of got mm. Slumdog Millionaire in my head for some reason. But there's kids on the street, yep. you know, haggling for money, in and out of cars, going here and there, you know. Yep. Is so, that safe? Or? So what would we do if we passed the strengths-based approach lens across that focus area? Well, straight away, I, I think about um, I think about uh, the recreation, outdoor recreation uh, aspect to our program, our mm. course, um, and looking at it from a strengths-based perspective, which is, you know, what are some of the things that I can do? For example, you know, we take mm. some aspect here about first aid and emergency management and emergency care. Um, that's a big component of the curriculum so that the students can go out and engage in the mm. outdoor yeah. education um, mm. activities and be confident. Yeah, what resources do we yeah. have around that can enable us to feel more yeah. safe? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. And, and yeah. often your road safety stuff is all about trauma and death and what you're going to die and one in four people mm. are dead and it takes 30, 30 metres to stop a car and at, at 30, 40 k an hour that's going to kill someone. We never really talk about the proactive kind of kind of stuff around why okay what does it mean to be a, a share the road and and to mm. enjoy the road and to you know so the positive side of of road safety kind of gets ignored so yeah. a strengths-based approach mm. would go well, okay let's think about not just the death and destruction and the deficit but what mm. you know how how can this be um, a more functional useful supportive environment yeah. um i think that would be a turn that on its head i think especially yeah. looking at the um safe and unsafe situations sort of within the community yeah. they could definitely mm. draw upon all the safe um, support networks um, mm -hmm. in the community. So if we threw a valuing movement activity or a card on top of that, you could do things, you think about walking to and from school or cycling to and from school, you think about your um, notion of first aid and, and how that impacts workplace. Um, yeah, we also have an open water safety program yeah. as well. So, so I mean, sort of stuff. how good would it be as part of a movement program that mm. everyone learnt first aid mm. and how to, you know, drag a drag a body uh, or, or reposition a, a body into the recovery position or those oh, yeah. as part of movement um, yeah. Yeah. even. Yep. 
yeah, sure. you think of the ambulance service or the fireies, what kind of stuff mm. do they need to be able to do? SES, car mm. rescue, mm. sum up a situation, you know, there's a lot of movement things you could throw in there as well. Yeah, sure. You could get guest speakers in for things like that too. Mm. Have people yeah. that are actually Good, out yeah, the surf life-saving mm. mm -hmm. SES. Yep. All right. If we chucked a, um, what's another card we haven't looked at? Health literacy. Yeah. Health literacy. Health literacy. So, in terms of safety, how would you, how could you look at that? I we'll sort of understand the first aid. Mm. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's start. I think you touched on it, Justin, about that knowing that what exactly. we the thing, around you. The yeah. interesting thing here is you, you the now idea yeah. of safety and, uh, and looking at, at that solutionistic, you know, mm. but approach. But it may in yeah. fact be just showing you that it seems to have lots of pieces to this puzzle. So my suggestion, or Justin and my suggestion, is that you actually don't worry about all the pieces of the puzzle just yet, but grab onto these propositions and bring the pieces of the puzzle to you. So drive your reforms and drive your policy and your changes and your planning with these five, and then pick and choose the things that match your students. Pick and choose the activities, the types of content that matches them, and then dip into the curriculum in the fur, which obviously is our next step. On the piece of pearl paper, you will find a piece of curriculum content that's cut on copy from diving in deep the curriculum itself. Drilling down. Right? So what you'll notice here is you'll notice in brackets you'll see R, H and M, S and things like that there. And those are the things you just talked about before, the focus areas. So see how everything's starting to make sense? But if you jump straight to here, you don't know what you're talking about. It's too confusing. All right, have a go at that with your legs now, have a conversation. Um, choose the one that I've got showing here. You've got obviously your health one on health one one side and a phys ed one on the other. Let's have a look at whichever one is up here now. Bring your lens and have a chat. <coughs> Transition and change. Let's throw a card at that, see what happens. Transition and change. Health literacy. Physical change. Well, I'm already thinking gender. You know, with health literacy, it's you've you've got such an opportunity to to bring in media and and have a look at how um, yeah, they you know, betray gender. Yeah, yeah but also the society. positive sides as well, and and maybe change over time. Hmm. That, that things have changed considerably, hmm. um, but also, I mean, I, I guess you can't shy away from the situations no and don't really and, and please don't get confused with strengths-based approach that says never yeah. never approach the dark side it, it is about acknowledging yeah. that and working with it and appreciating it and then thinking about how do we now use mm. our resources and our assets to, to, to build on what yeah got. move it forward yeah. to progress it mm. so you know, yeah it could so be very much oh side. yeah and you need to shine a light on because that's what a socio-critical yeah. perspective mm. is is to shine a light on the on the the problem, you know, the imbalance and the power. Yeah, and then your solution to that is probably going to come from your strengths, yeah. if that makes sense. I'm also thinking, you know, the current, um, current situations in just culture in general, Australian culture, um, things that have happened recently, like the yes vote, and yeah. all of those types of oh, things yeah. would, would link into mm. this. So you could really bring news and... and, and yeah. Common things that discuss things that are happening in their lives. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, Even family and stuff. Yeah, I'm going to put that on it, which is just mm. a, a a focus on mental health, actually. Um, that uh, so, if we th if we looked at that from a mental health perspective, we'd start to see from a strengths based approach, you know, um, concepts of resilience, building, building mm. resilience, building uh, confidence, and and uh, and so on. So. Yep. So, you know, particularly that third one there about practicing safe self talk and help seeking yep. strategies, I think, has a strength based yep. uh, component. I think I'm, I sort of struggled at the start with the uh, first one I picked out was value movement, and oh, yeah. instantly when I looked at the health side of things, I struggled, and then I thought about with the valuing movement, the value in movement, um, you could, could link that to the feelings and the yeah. changes that they're going yeah, through, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, well, you yeah, think movement in that context, you've got the cultural 
traditions and practices mm. and how do you feel you know as a uh, a muslim person in an aussie rules footy club about the drinking culture or the mm. oh, yeah. you know that that might be something you can unpack or yeah. how would how do we think about um gambling and um as we, as we grow, gambling becomes more pervasive and in our face and how do we transition into adulthood, understanding mm. that concept in a sporting context as much as it is in a societal context. Yeah. So, mm. you know, PE, you can start to unpack because kids talk about sport now in terms of odds, you know, and you can Sports you can good. use that in your phys ed lessons as much as you can mm. in the health. It's so, also, I think, um, coming from a personal experience around that that sort of age I was understanding my body and my capabilities almost yeah yeah I was just gonna say yeah, that everybody's going to have a different level of what they can do in movement wise so with this this as a lens onto that it's understanding that everybody's going to be different, different. And where they're at yeah. yeah notions of difference and un and you know those team building games and, and things like yeah. that and the socio-critical lens would really unpack that idea of difference that we are all unique, we're all different. Mm. Um, we all have a strength, we all have something to bring to the, the table. Mm. Phys ed or the sport kind of one, the phys ed kind of focus one that's on the other side of this piece of paper. See if you can bring um, these things also to this, all of them, strength-based, value, health literacy. Health literacy, someone else told me, could be the thing that binds the whole thing. Maybe we're all just trying to be movement literate and health literate for health purposes and to be able to make particular choices in our lives. Maybe critical inquiry fits across the whole thing. I don't know what the picture looks like, but let me know and we'll trademark it and uh, make our lives sort of... We won't make money. Because we can't work this out. It's just <laughs> interrelated, as our friend Andy said. All right, so take a look. Quick, that should be a quick process because we did the first one. Where do you see it? What might it look like? Now we're going from interpretation and lens through to how we teach it, what might we do? As soon as I said the fitness plans, um, yeah, I was, if you, if you don't put it, yes, yeah, if you don't so put an I. educative purpose on it, then it's yeah. a waste of time. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. That you know the amount of times that I, I saw my sixes doing their um, beep test, and you know there was always those three yeah. left at the end. It was always linked to cross country as well. And then, then I got to the stage where I got to about year ten, and I realised once I got past level six and someone else dropped out, I was happy not to be the first <laughs> one, and that was it. Right. Yeah. Um, when when I was teaching. Um, graphing and things like that because my kids really loved sport the majority um, we used to do things like um, we do a some type of a playground challenge where they do run around and then um, take the pulses after that so there was actually a, a reason you know we were seeing what mm. what type of activity got what type of pulse and then who was in what range and where were we going to graph that and and so we were integrating it really nicely, but it had a purpose of why we were actually doing it. I think I, with the educative purpose, I had a, a, a starting example. So the, the PE teacher, okay, kids come in, sat down, took their pulse, uh, did yeah. 30 minutes of skipping mm. and then took their pulse at the end. And I think the, the, educative, the educative purpose, although on surface level, it might have been there that at the start of the lesson your pulse was low, at the end it was high. Yeah. But then I think the teacher didn't unpack mm. the reasons mm. why, and I yeah. think at, at the end of the day that was probably a useless lesson. Yeah, they definitely but had a comparative, you know, something that was ass assessing in a way, but there wasn't an educative purpose. Mm. So um, I think that kind of leads to strengths-based approach. In, in a bit, I'm thinking, you know, with with things like this, you're, you're yeah, you're really opening like a. Bit of a Pandora's box of ability ranges. Yeah, and so how do you cater for difference yeah. and um, draw on individual strengths yeah. to then develop something that's unique and, and able to meet their needs? Um, it's hard, isn't it, for this one? I think. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. can pick. I could. I've got one example that I remember from the past where someone actually held a skipping rope, sort of down lower at one end and higher at the other end, and sort of said, you know, "If you if you jump on it here, then by the end of the." The mm. fitness program, hopefully you can jump on it a bit a bit further. So setting small Sounds goals. Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take that from the O'Connor files? Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I'm thinking that idea of empowerment, you know, and I'm kind of coming from that primary view. I had students in year six who were incredibly self-conscious and, you know, to the point that they wouldn't go 
um, swimming or mm. wouldn't put themselves yeah, out there. Yeah, they wouldn't yeah. even, you know, have a go at anything. Mm. Um, so to, to put a fitness plan and I guess you've got to get that, that lens of health. So it's a, it, in yeah, too. it's also about developing that notion of, um, yeah. you know, health related, skill related um, capacity. So um, how do you build that? not necessarily for a fitness plan, but how do you build that as a sort of, a, you know, how do you give them the confidence and mm. competence to feel like they want to do more physical activity in a way that they're not being threatened? And part of that would be to, you know, remove a, um, a performative component that compares them to everyone else in the class and says, this is the best kid and you're the worst kid and therefore, you know, you don't belong here. This is not for mm. you. So how do you allow individual, yeah. you know, a, an educative purpose should be, should be a purposeful for everyone in the class. So you've got 30 kids, there should be 30 reasons why I need to do this activity. Mm. And so you have to think broadly about what that means. So it's not just about everybody attaining a particular level, but it's about progression, individual progression. So I think having nuanced educative purposes is part of the battle. So I guess different entry points and different yeah. exit points as well. So yeah. not everybody has to be able yeah. to shoot a hoop. Yeah. You might need to be able to, you know, lift your arms by the end yeah. or whatever. So we acknowledge be. everyone comes into this yeah. starting from different starting points. Yeah, exactly. But the whole aim of this is we want to push you forward and we want it to be a positive, yeah. enjoyable experience. So um, the educative purpose should reflect that mm. concept of progression. Um, and not make you walk out the other end feeling terrible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I'm even thinking, you know, the way that you you, res, you record results mm. is always in Absolutely. that one on line that scale. Of A, to, A to F. Yep. Exactly. So, and you are next to all the other kids. Yep. Yeah. Like that's Especially on a traditional it. rubric that has, you know, will perform the layup, um, takes two steps, you know, puts the ball up with the right hand. Mm. Um, achieve success nine out of ten. So the kid who's played basketball since they were four is yep. going to get an A, and we oh, already know right. that. Yep. The kid who's never touched a basketball is going to fail. Um, they already know that. You could almost assess them before you started teaching. Mm. So how do you change that rubric to something that shows progression, not just um, already brought what a set of skills that you've already brought to class at the start of the activity? And I guess that's the other side as well, Justin, is that you already know your kids inside yeah. out. Yeah. So why even do that? It's like a beep test. Yeah. You could you could already score them on the beep yeah. test mm -hmm. before they start. Mm -hmm. You'd already know. Yeah. Fifteen for some. Um, <laughs> Fifteen. I don't know about that. Fifteen. Wow. <laughs> you said six before. <laughs> yeah, you you're straight up to six. <laughs> okay. Mm, it's really interesting. And tough, you know, you do would be put tough, a that. whole bomb on it yeah. sometimes. You do, to you just absolutely do. To break down what currently exists and mm. has existed mm. for, I mean, I've been teaching 18 years. Yeah, decades. It's existed that long and it's been... When we were at school, we oh. been, yeah. That's what, the thing I found was that, like, when I was at school, well, when I went to placement, right, what I was doing at school is yeah. still, still happening. Let's, oh, do yeah. little, um, oh, yeah. let's do a little review activity for just where you're at the moment. You just had some cool conversations about how you might be able to continue to use these propositions as a lens and how we might be starting to think about them pedagogically. What we'd like you to do is just on a little piece of paper. Do you take HP students? Just on a little piece of paper is write down three things that you learned from that previous process that have just gone through, maybe two things that you were reminded so of, I know some people are having some little sorry, do you mean sparks student? flying off everywhere. Yes. Oh, that oh, reminds yeah. me of set and set theory. Oh, that reminds me of what I did in special yeah. ed. Yeah. Those are all really good things because oh, you're actually making curriculum connections as well. Yeah. And then maybe yeah. one oh, question to have. Take a little moment to do that one now. Then we're going to give you one last very practical activity that takes all the brain power. All they're full of just categories. What are you on? Hey, I'm spruiking HP here. Now they are. She is. So those folks at home, you might like to if you had any questions or if you've had any things, some three things that you've learned or that you're reminded of or some things you have some questions about. We might have some time and space now to maybe share some of them. Well, if folks are the stuff where we're in their lessons, then you know, you need people that are really quite driven, and I think having that layer of HPE in general. So, so we do, do want to finish the time. time. This is not the conclusion. Mm -hmm. This is actually good job at everything. the main yeah. course. We have to see what these students, yeah. students are. That they coach external yes. to their degree. Yeah. They work with How are you going? 
from a really great Any good questions they going into placement no, having a really moment, great foundation have already been okay, great. immersed in that. We'd be very interested to see. Yeah, yeah. Your responses, most especially, most especially um, Justin and I'll be interested in the questions you have because our educated purpose in today was quite clear at the start. So if you still have questions around it, then we might go back to the drawing board. It informs our practices. Things have not changed. <laughs> You've been here. Ah, yes. Things have not changed. Well. You already knew that. What are you saying? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I did know that. That's because Costa hasn't finished his degree yet. I That's know. All. <laughs> I'm the young blood here. I'm so young. I think we still have. What do I still have a question? Just a little pause in there. I, I have still have a question about you know the conditions of testing and things. Like all right. Like how do you now make money. it equitable? Justin's got the microphone, look out. Come on, give us a little bit of a minute oil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, is there anyone who would like to share um, maybe one thing you've learned um, or you were reminded of or a question that you might have? Justin's got the microphone, we have two and a half minutes to share. If there's someone who's had a huge aha moment or who has a question that maybe Dexter can answer. Come on, don't be shy. This is your time to shine. Uh, just, just as an old bloke that's a CRT now, just to remember how archaic the, uh, the ways I used to teach compared with, with this sort of approach. Oh, that deserves a round of applause, that does. Talk about critical reflection, it never stops, eh? And uh, it just makes us do things better, I think. Nice job, thank you. Um, it reminded me of how exciting and challenging my job can be and like learn how good learning is for me not just my my students yeah lifelong learning right yeah. the thing i'm coming in from a math science base certainly not health or pe um, but what i've noticed is that it seems to be about change change from where the individual child starts at to where you can make them grow to which is something that we don't do in maths and science we compare against the pass mark mm -hmm. Whoa. So it's a little you bit... You heard it right here. HPA seminars at Monash, breaking boundaries. Uh, the, the question I have, I'm still uh, somewhat confused around... Um, when I look at these five propositions, I instantly think I can use these for planning. Um, the assessment side of thing I haven't really delved into yet. I'd, I'd, I'd love to take it that next step to look at it as how I can apply these to assessment, not just mm -hmm. the planning of the work. Yep. Um, so what's the question in there, James? Um, how did you do it or what would we what's suggest? What's an example or of how, I'm how I can use these in an assessment or use these as a lens for assessment instead of uh, planning the, the work? Yeah, OK, I'm glad you asked that. Um, our next activity is an activity that uh, is around planning it for your teaching and learning. Let me just show you a handout that I've got. That Here's something I prepared earlier, um, which shows how we might begin to design assessment, uh, thinking about the content that we're exploring and the content that we're discovering. So if we take a look at this, this is a fairly standard assessment form, it lists the date and the time and when it's due and probably for New South Wales folks, thank goodness they've got outcomes actually listed and we have to work ours out everywhere else. Um, the content descriptions, you would put the content in there because quite clearly you're going to have to make some choices about what you're assessing. That might be where you get some extraneous and extra things like your general capabilities that you might also add into there, your health, your, your, um, literacy, numeracy, um, uh, ethical, social responsibilities. Um, and then, so we've got all the content, this is the back end stuff, as any of us would plan, and it goes hand in hand with a, with a planning instrument like this, which is a lesson planning template, and we'd be filling these in at the same time. So while I'm thinking about my amazing pedagogies that I'm using in my teaching that use these propositions, I'm also thinking about how I might assess them. Now we need to still have scores and columns and valid and validity and reliability, but I don't think it precludes us by talking about these propositions. So then what we're thinking about, we're starting to design 
with them in mind. So when we start thinking about the task, we're thinking about student growth, if that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about what the educative purpose is and we need to be able to test that. Justin? Did you yes. want to add? Am I on? Am I on? Test. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, um, you know, I use these, well, I use these kind of questions a lot when I think about assessment or, um, you know, what that might look like. So, you know, am I assessing just the deficit um, side of things or am I assessing the strengths? Am I assessing um, their ability to critically interpret and understand information and use that to support their own health and well-being? So am I, am I, when I assess, am I actually asking that question of them? Um, when I'm assessing, am I assessing, um, you know, their ability to critically inquire, to ask questions of what they're looking at in a critical way, in a socio-critical way, even where they challenge, you know, who's, who's got power? Um, can they see where power and balance might lie? And can they do that from an informed perspective? So assessment, I think, draws on all of these things and your educative purpose, if that's not aligned with your assessment, then you don't have a very clear educative purpose. So educative purpose should be really heavily driven um, through assessment as well. So um, I, I can't see the distinction between planning and assessment and nor curriculum. So if you're looking at curriculum, you're also thinking about assessment and you're also thinking about the pedagogy, the way you're going to teach them. And those three things should just be swirling around in your head all the time and you shouldn't jump from I'm going to plan and now I'm going to discard something and jump into assessment and now I'm going to discard something and jump into curriculum. The curriculum, you should have the curriculum document, you should have um, ways you could assess and you should have um, pedagogies and ways to teach all part of that planning process and without, I think, separating them is a folly. Yeah, um, and I think one of the disservices, as much as we love them, that a lot of uh, systemic organisations like VCAA, the AAS, um, the DETs and, and those sorts of things in other states, one of their disservices is that their, re their remit is focusing on uh, assessment and reporting evidence mm. of students being at st its particular standards. So we're getting lots of evidence of or illustrations of what this kid is going to look like at the end of, say, stage eight, uh, stage four in New South Wales or year seven and eight bands or, or levels in Victoria. Those are making us think about the end result as a test, whereas a focus on educative purpose is thinking as the end result as a, as, a, as a human, as a person who matures and grows in particular ways. So it's the end of what? What do you want the child to, at the end of your class, at the end of the week, at the end of the term, at the end of the year, at the end of time, when they're 20, 30 or 40, what things have they taken? Their educative purposes, and we might never know them, but there's nothing wrong with setting assessment tasks up that take them towards those things. If we start with instrumental things like being able to do a fitness plan so you, what, get fit, great. My question is why? My question is why is it limited about what I can choose in my fitness plan? And my question is when might I use my fitness plan at all? Mm. One of the things that strikes me as being really important about these and, and the fact they're in the, in the curriculum at all is a bit of a win. Like, if you think of curriculum documents, they are heavily contested. Everybody throws their, their cards in and they're like, we, gotta, we make sure we have this, make sure we have this. Part of the reason we have a crowded curriculum is because there's so many stakeholders wanting so many things and asking so much of it. It becomes a bit of a, a mishmash, a bit of a mess of things, right? Um, and no other curriculum that I know of has these in them. So what these are is a really sneaky way, because curriculum's not supposed to talk about pedagogy. It's not supposed to mention how uh, or why. So what they've been able to do by working these propositions in is kind of sneak that un in, under the radar. And I don't know how they did it, but they did it. And um, it's a kind of a nice thing to have, because it gives you signposts for how you might go about teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the teaching and learning side of this stuff, not just curriculum as, a, as an isolated standalone thing. So I think it should draw you into that idea of, um, okay, well, this is the curriculum, but now what does it look like when I teach it? So I teach it using a strengths-based approach, or I teach it using critical inquiry, or I teach it, um, you know, drawing on um, the notion that we're going to value movement in this. 
and I think that's really neat. Yeah, and then you dip into you dip into the focus areas and you dip into the content to make those choices, but you're looking to build strengths, to value movement, to think critically. You're looking to do these things. You start to embody them and then you start to teach in those ways. And I think we, we do that anyway. I think we naturally want to do that. Sometimes I think curriculum constrains us. I'm all, I'm all about these things busting it open, actually, and making it uh, you know way more productive and potentially enjoyable for you as a teacher. Uh, and also amazingly enjoyable for kids in your classes. Mm. We're not going to have a chance to do that activity, and I have sent to the home groups uh, who are viewing uh, copies of those lesson plan templates. So if, if that's the next step to go to your teams and your schools um, to use these kinds of templates to make sure you're thinking about it. So the next part is design. It's the design and creating. It's making the choices. It's what you as a professional have gone to university for four years or more to study, to learn. And you get to make these choices. And this is a very rare moment, as Justin said, because we've got this pedagogical advice, which essentially means everybody around the world. He didn't say it's like unique in the world. It's actually unique in the world. Everyone around the world is watching and waiting and see what we do with these things. So I think to leave them out, what we're doing is going, oh, well, we'll just keep doing business as usual. And that will be the folly, I think. Um, they're an opportunity um, to take some risks um, and to make the story up how it suits your context. And that's, I think, the big thing as well. It's very contextual. So the next activity would be uh, aware of time and, uh, and, and the need to, uh, to leave very shortly to develop a lesson plan or a lesson activity. And alongside that, using ideas around uh, philosophy of constructive alignment, writing assessment tasks at the same time. Oh dear, that old thing. But it's a really good idea and it's good pedagogy. Right, so then an assessment task, that would be designing them, using them at the same time. You have all the skills and the resources. Now you know where to find the content. Now you use your professional knowledge to make those choices about what goes where and for whom. All right, here we are. Take a little moment now, take a little moment now and rewrite your headline. Is your headline different if you can find it on that lovely messy table which looks like you're doing some activities? Is your headline different and has it changed? Is it ha if it has, rewrite it. We'd love to share if there's anyone who'd like to share their pre and post headline. But you don't have to. Write your new headline. Um, ask about copies of the materials. We'll get them all sent out. Yeah. That's probably the best way to do it, yeah. yeah. Does anyone have a headline they would like to share, perhaps? Anyone? Manny, got a headline? No. Good work. Good job. Well done, Justin. <laughs> Um, so mine was interrelated lenses to challenge HBE as we know it. Very good. <laughs> like it. Yeah, so you can Anyone have. else? Want to read their headline? The headline? Oh, yeah, here we go. I'm starting from a low base. That's okay. <laughs> I know, that's good. <laughs> yes, I think it is. Um, mine is value the positive and always take it further. Yeah, nice. Very good. It's very strengths based. <laughs> Anyone else? Excellent. So everyone wants to have a go now. Uh, mine is, I only have got two more years to go, so I'm just a student still. <laughs> I've still got two more years to go within the course, so definitely it's going to be a long, definite journey with Justin and Karen, you know, supporting me and scaffolding me mm -hmm. to, uh, to be able to teach HP in this new, new way. Gosh, are you neat. intimidated by that or are you excited by that? Yeah. You're intimidated? <laughs> Is that, there's You're not a lot. supposed to say that. Wait a minute. Did you pay him? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> there's a lot to All do. Right. All right. Okay. So well, what I'm interested to, to know is... Um, is over here on the board, Justin did a little bit of sorting out of our starting points. And... Um, so, Karen, over here we had... Um, we had a couple of people with a bit of an inclusion lens. They wanted to see how this would work for everybody, which I think is, is relatively important. Hopefully, I think we've addressed that idea of um, notions of difference come really strongly through these propositions and, and appreciating difference. You know, the critical inquiry isn't just 
going away and researching something, but it's having a socio-critical lens to understand power imbalance and to, to unpack those kinds of ideas. So we want to really promote, if we're looking at strengths, every single person in your class has something to offer. It's not just the sporty kids or the kids who, who know a lot of stuff, but when we have a strengths-based approach, everybody contributes, everybody can bring something to the table. And so I think we kind of talk about notions of inclusion quite well um, when we talk about the propositions. There was a group of people who just wanted to know what they are and, and that kind of um, cognitive knowledge around it, and I think we kind of unpacked that early in the session. Um, it's really weird looking at yourself on that screen. Um, there was a group of people who wanted to understand the, how it's practiced. So what does it look like when, when it gets practiced? And I think we, we moved through that process. We didn't get to lesson plans and assessment tasks, but I think we're ready to, to take that step. Um, certainly the group I was working with are ready for that. Um, a little bit on wanting to know, um, focusing just on the inquiry part, what did that mean? And others were really interested in how do you apply it to planning? And I think I'm reasonably confident in saying we've addressed most of those things um, tonight, which is good. Nice. We have one minute, Justin, if you would mind pushing that amazing button. All right. So the, they're yours up there. It's, and these were our educative purposes. These were our anticipated outcomes. I think they fit nicely with the things up there, knowing stuff, being able to do stuff, um, and gaining some confidence. Um, and they were our outcomes. Now, some people have asked about the cards and where you get the cards. So in terms of purchasing these cards, you can buy them in New South Wales, you can buy them through Atchipa New South Wales, and they have PD, HPE on them. If you're in other states and territories, you can buy them through the Atchipa National Store, their online store. Um, these slide notes will be sent to you, so you'll be able to use them as well. So you can have whole, whole uh, sets of them. So the slide notes will be sent to you. All right, so that's our seminar, uh, Health and Physical Education and some innovative ideas. We thank you sincerely for attending um, and for being involved in it and, and most especially for sharing your ideas at this table. Thank you very much. And if you have any more questions, we'd be most happy to have a chat after the session or you can email us, uh, either one of us. Um, we have some survey um, information here that we'd like to gather through marketing. And uh, so at your leisure, you might complete that. Um, and otherwise, uh, everyone at home, thank you for tuning in. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, team. Thanks, everybody.